you'd like to know how two sisters were able to build a multi-million dollar online custom shoe company in about a year, we're going to find out today thanks to my guest, Dorian Howard, who is one of the co-founders of Milk and Honey Shoes, and she is coming to us all the way from Los Angeles. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Dorian. Oh, thank you for having me, Chrissia. So, Dorian, I honestly think that you and your sister have the dream business for any woman because you basically create custom shoes and I don't know what else you know a woman could want more in her life than being able to have a new pair of shoes every week if she wants to but I wanted to know how did it get started for you how did you come up with this idea sure you know it's easy enough my sister in her previous job her, her travel sent her around the world, and she really traveled many different countries on many different continents, and she's always been very interested in fashion and shoes specifically. So she started getting her clothes made, and that led to getting her shoes made. So she'd come back to the States, and everyone would see her shoes and say, those are amazing, where did you get those? And that went on for years, and, and then it started, her friends would say, can you make me a pair? And she'd start doing them for friends and for me, and the idea of the business just grew from there. Oh, and you started the business about a year ago, so in, two, in 2010? Correct. We officially launched in 2010. It took us about a year before then to put the pieces together, figure out our business model, understand the technology that was involved in, in launching this company, and most importantly, to, to find the skilled craftsmen to make it mm -hmm. a reality. Absolutely. That's definitely one, going to be one of the questions that I have for you. So it's interesting. So when you say that your sister had, had been traveling the world and she'd been doing this for years, how many years before you decided let's turn this into this idea into a, into a business? Well, we both had previous careers in corporate America where you know we have bosses and business development meetings and end of year reviews and PowerPoint presentations. And when we'd be frustrated with our jobs, you know, we'd be on the phone or we'd be home for Thanksgiving and we'd talk about starting a business together. And my sister was the one who first came up with the idea of starting this as a shoe company. So for years, we would dream about it. I mean, never really thinking we'd give up our secure, nice paying corporate jobs to dive into the deep end. But as we got older, as we kind of wanted more out of life, the dream started taking more of a shape and we realized we could actually make a go of it. Wow, that, that's amazing because it, it is a big adventure and, and I want to talk about that because we, you talked about logistics, you talked about finding craftsmen, we're talking about material, we're talking about almost uh, um, ready to order. So basically people order and then you have to have the material ready to actually create the shoes and turn that around in a fairly short period of time. So it's going to be really exciting to talk about that. So you and your sisters are both partners, but you both have distinct roles, or do you both do more or less the same and piggyback on each other? You know, we are very, very different, and our skill sets complement each other very well. And that's something we've always known growing up, how different we were. Um, she always played team sports. I always played individual sports. She always wanted salty. I always wanted sweet. I mean, we are night and day. She, Speaking of, I wake up very early. She stays up late at night. So when we started to divide up our work responsibilities, it happened organically. They're just, I like numbers. I like spreadsheets. I like facts. Mm -hmm. My sister's much better with the design. I'm better with customer service. She's better dealing with our vendors. So there are very few areas in which we, that we overlap. And also, we really trust each other. So when there is something that we both have an opinion on, you know, we both present our cases. And, you know, usually it's like, okay, if you feel strongly about it, you can have it. Okay. And are there any challenges in working with your sister? Because sometimes partnerships are a little, you know, the sort of touchy because people really get to know each other's personality. I mean, I always like to say that you really know somebody when you've worked with them and when you've divorced them. Uh, so um, working with your sister, have there been any challenges? Or the fact oh. that both of you have fairly distinct personalities, it's been smooth sailing. Absolutely. It's, it's been challenging, but truly, I could not imagine doing this with anyone else. I mean, as, as you know, and you're talking to so many different women you've spoken to, starting a business is an all-consuming, soul-wrenching, day in, day out. You are running a marathon every single day. So when you know you're doing it with a true partner, someone who's working as hard as you, who's risking as much as you, who believes in it as much as you do, it takes a lot of the pressure off. And with your someone, your sister, there's no one in the world I trust more than my sister. So I don't have to worry about, hmm, I have to transfer money between our bank accounts. What is she doing with it? 
I don't have to worry that she's working as hard as I am because I know she is. So mm-hmm. that's right. I mean, the difficult part is we're sisters. So while we've always gotten along really well, you do enter the professional relationship with 30 years of personal baggage. Um, and it's also, it's hard because while I love my sister as my business partner, I oftentimes miss my sister as my sister mm-hmm. because we don't get on the phone so much and chit chat. We get on the phone and go over numbers or go, you know, go over vendor issues we're having or go over, go over technical problems. Okay. So that's been hard too. And it's important for us to carve out sister time. Mm, okay. And it's interesting what you just said at the beginning of this conversation when you talked about leaving the security of a comfort uh, or and the comfort, should I say, of a corporate job. You have a, a nice paycheck. You, you work X number of hours. You have your weekends off. You know, you know that somebody else is taking care of other operations, but when you are the entrepreneur, it is your business, you're wearing so much, so many hats, and when you talk about the marathon being, you know, sort of run every day, it's such a great analogy. <laughs> so, oh, it's true. Oh, no, absolutely. And uh, you talked about money being transferred between accounts. When it comes to financing this whole project, because mm-hmm. it definitely is quite a big and undertaking. Uh, Was it your uh, savings that you used or did you go out to a bank and got a bank loan? How were you able to finance the first few months of uh, operations? Sure. Because of our business model, it's such that it didn't take tremendous amount of startup costs. We don't carry an inventory. We don't have a storefront. And those are two very sizable monetary contributions to starting a company. So we were able to bootstrap the entire company ourselves, which is something we're really proud of. That's amazing that you were able to do that. (laughs) Thank you. And were there any fears attached to using your own money and then creating this uh, venture? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, it's your nest egg, right? It is the money that I've been saving since I was 18 years old. It was, you know, my bat mitzvah bonds from my great grandfather. I mean, it really was those things you kept underneath your mattress. You are you're risking everything, but the way, you know, the way I look at it is I'm in my thirties. I have plenty of time to make more money. So if it should, should knock on wood, anything go wrong, you know, I'll be okay. I think if I had, um, if I were older and this was my retirement fund, that would be something different, but you know, I've got a lot of energy. We'll make it work. Interesting. And actually it's interesting what you just uh, said about, uh, being older. I've actually been interviewing women who are in their fifties, sixties and seventies when they first started uh, their businesses. And it's interesting because, I mean, although at 30 you may think, oh, well, I have a lot of time. For a lot of women at 70, they're like, well, if I'm going to, quote, unquote, leave this earth in my 90s or 100, I still have 30 years in front of me. So it is interesting. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, what about your team? Uh, there's you, your sister. I'm sure there's more people. So how, do you, how have you structured your team? Sure. Um, I work in Los Angeles, and I have a handful of people that are working with me here. Um, My sister runs our Asia office, and she's got a handful of people that work with her there. But the most exciting thing for us is it was important to us to find the best people for the job, not the people that were closest to us. Okay. So we have freelancers all over the world that are working on our projects. We've got illustrators and tech support and different sorts of designers that are really working everywhere, which is fantastic for us because we're not limited with who we can hire. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, time zones can be a killer. When you're trying to find balance in your life, Ooh, yet yes. you're at 7 o'clock in the morning and there's somebody in a different time zone that's working away and asking you questions, yes. or it's midnight and there's someone else in a different time zone that's working and asking you questions, it's very hard to unplug, but we've decided that it's worth it for us to get the best people for the job. And is your sister in America or is she in Asia? My sister lives in Asia. She oversees all our manufacturing, all our production. She is in and out of our workshops all the time, and she's really there to do quality control. I don't know how we could do it if one of the partners was not actually in Asia. Okay, and are we talking about China? My sister's based in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Um, Our workshops are in China, but she can just jump on the train and go there. Okay. And uh, when you talked about not limiting yourself to people who are close to you in terms of finding uh, them to create your team was that a challenge because I mean it's one thing finding people it's another thing finding the right people and it's another thing finding the best people yes um it's been that's been very very challenging especially on the tech side um to find people that can do the job you want at the caliber you want it done Mm -hmm. in the time frame you want it done 
has been, it continues to be a constant, constant challenge for us. So we've gone through a different, a few different sets of support teams. We've gone through some illustrators and designers. You know, we're very specific with how we want things done. We run a, a really high quality company and expect, you know, all the work that is put out by anyone affiliated with us mm -hmm. to be of the highest quality. Okay. Yeah, and that makes absolute sense. Um, when it comes to the material, now the shoes are made in China, but the material, where does the material come from? Are we talking about all over the world or are you focusing on traditional places when it comes to shoes like Italy or France? Truly all over the world. We get some materials from Europe, some materials from Asia, some materials from the United States. Similar to how we hire people in our company, if the best leather is in France, we'll buy it in France. If the best pony hair is in Italy, we'll buy it in Italy. You know, we're, we're not... Oh, we're not closed off to any possibility. As long as it's fantastic and high quality, we'll buy it. And you've been able to find vendors who are able to provide you with material to fit your business structure? Because in reality, you only start, quote-unquote, making the shoe when the shoe has been ordered. So are you able to find these vendors who could turn around the material in a quick manner and ship it out to China fairly quickly? Well we keep all we keep an inventory of all the material that we offer on our site. Okay. So um, there there have been situations where we've run out of material and had to quickly scramble to get it. But with my sister in Asia and the time zones and being able to run out to markets there, she's been able to kind of cover us the few times we've run into that situation. But for the most part, we keep a pretty tight inventory on the materials we have. Okay. And did your sister? I believe her name is Ileana. Ileana. Alyssa. Alyssa. Sorry. Um, did she have any, um, I guess, adjustment period? Um, you know, she's American, and mm -hmm. now she's living and working in Asia and also yeah. managing a team of people who are Chinese. So different working styles. Um, has she been, uh, is, has it been easy, should I say, for her to adapt, or did she have sort of that learning curve? Um, well, a, a combination. She had in her previous career, she worked in manufacturing and production, and did a lot of work in Asia. So she's had um, a, a years and years of experience of working with international people, understanding cultural differences, understanding work habits. It's it's truthfully, it's new. For, it's totally new for me. So I'll say something to my sister, and she'll say to me, "No, no, that's not how it's done here. Let me explain to you what this really means." And that's just knowledge that she's acquired over time. Okay. But it's certainly, my sister is a 5'9 blonde living in Hong Kong. So <laughs> she definitely she definitely stands out. And, she does. Uh, and there is definitely some cultural clashes a bit that, she's, that she has embraced. I mean, she loves living over there and has a wonderful life there. And she's taller than most men. Yes. <laughs> I'm nearly 5'9. So I, and I had a friend who, uh, blonde... Blue eyed, he lived in Japan for a while and he's six two, six three, so he stood out majorly uh in Japan. So it's it's interesting that you talk about that. Now the shoes, yeah. uh you have a certain uh, selection that people can choose from, and uh, women. Uh, how did you sort of pick and choose the selection that you that you offer? Sure. Um it's you know, we we're this shoe company was started because we were two women who love shoes. So we had very specific views on the type of shoes we wanted to offer. We also, you know, we pay attention to the runway shows, pay attention to trends, but also, you know, don't want to be too reactive to that. Certainly, if yellow is a big color in the spring run runway shows, we'll make sure we have enough yellow selections. But, you know, we also try to introduce some new items to our customers to see what they want. At the same time, a lot of our decisions are informed by our customers. Um, a perfect example is, you know, a certain color silk. We were seeing a lot of brides wanting lavender, and that's not a color we'd offer. Um, but once we had enough people request it, we went out and sourced the material, and now that's a color that we offer traditionally. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do, Dorian, is I'm going to have to stop the video because we're – oh, no, it's back. Skype sometimes is magical. Sometimes the image goes a little wonky, and now it's back. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so the, the, the shoe selection, basically, you, you're keeping it to, I guess – more classic um, shoe styles that you see, you know, in stores. Like basically, the big, the big Italian or French designers, they have a, you know sort of selection. It's more or less classic. Once in a while, depending on the season, they'll have something a little outlandish. So you follow the same pattern. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Now, you just talked about something that I find very interesting, and you talked about brides uh, and lavender. What I did notice on your site, and you have a really amazing testimonial page, so that means that women are loving what you're doing. What Thank I've you. noticed is that women are breaking away from the traditional satin white or satin beige or ecru color and they're going you talked about lavender but some brides are going even you know a little more they're a little more risque in their selection how do you explain that oh i it, at a very specific point in time when the first sex in the city movie came out and carrie bradshaw chose that cobalt blue manolo blonic it was the shoe oh. around the world that changed so beautiful wedding fashion i mean for over the last seven years now, and, and who knows how long this trend will continue, but I love it. It's so much more fun for us to make these brightly colored shoes and add glitter options, and brides are really going out on a limb with the colors they're choosing. Similar to Sex and City, we've done a ton of the cobalt blue shoes. Mm. We've made a lot of red sparkle shoes. We had one bride who lined the inside of her dress in red crinoline, and so it just popped out of the bottom with her red glitter heels. It were gorgeous. Oh, that is so amazing. So the red, the, the blue cobalt shoe, that would be a satin shoe. Yes, we're doing a lot of satin shoes for brides, obviously. But, you know, it's not that limited anymore. We, we're seeing brides in uh, in zebra print. We've had a handful of brides that did, shows a pony hair zebra print that looks fantastic. And we've done leather and patent leather and suede for winter weddings. So the days of white silk shoes or dyables, they're over. That's amazing. And also the other advantage is that the bride can actually use the shoe again. Absolutely. And this is something I, I, I say time and time again is as a bride, you're going to spend a lot of money on your wedding dress, a lot of money. And you should because it's going to be the focal point of all your pictures and it's going to make you feel like a princess and make you feel beautiful. But you will never, ever, ever wear that dress again. No. Nobody cuts it. Nobody dyes it. Nobody adds straps. Nobody wears it again. Nope. So if you can buy a pair of shoes that you can wear on your honeymoon, that you can wear at your birthday party, that you can wear with a pair of jeans. You know, weddings are expensive. Anything you can repurpose for afterwards, I think, is a good way to go. And shoes are the best option, honestly. I, I really uh, love the concept of brides breaking away from tradition and Thank you for, for explaining how it came about. I actually saw the movie, loved the movie, loved the whole series, but I didn't actually realize that those shoes were the turning point when it came to brides dis or, or, uh, allowing themselves, I guess, to, to go a different route. Yeah. So how long does it take those brides and your other customers to get their shoes? So when they go to the site, they sort of selected the type of shoe that they want, they've selected the material. How long does it take them once they press on that buy button? Sure. Um, you know, our turnaround time is something that we're really working hard to decrease, and we've got a bunch of different avenues we're exploring to do that. So our eventual goal is to get it down to about four weeks from the time you purchase the shoe, we make it and ship it to you. Okay. So it's, it's, it's great. I mean, this is a custom shoe, and it takes about a month to get it. Currently, it's a little bit more than that, but I do think shortly we'll get it down to a month. Right now, it's about six weeks. Okay. Perfect. So, you know, I, I know that this is a question that it could be interesting, but I wanted to know, in, in your opinion, you know, based on your company and also based on the testimonial that you're getting from your clients, what's the big advantage of getting a shoe from Milk and Honey, which takes about four weeks, versus going to the store and buying a shoe that you can get basically immediately? Oh, gosh, I, I don't think you can compare. Um, when you order your shoes through us, you have control over the color, the material, the heel height, which is very, very important. You know, you were mentioning that you're almost 5'9". I'm 5'7". You know, I don't, I wear five inch heels because I love them and they look beautiful. But on a day to day basis, I love a, what a lot of the couture shoes look like, but I need to be wearing a lower heel. Mm -hmm. So when you can choose your strap options, choose your heel height, choose your color, you know, it makes shopping in a department store feeling so, feel so limited now. Mm, absolutely. And to be honest, four weeks is not that long because most of us have more than one pair of shoes to wear anyways. <laughs> a few more than one pair, yes. Yes. I did read how many pairs your sister came back with when she was in Italy. Mm, on your website. She came back with a suitcase full of shoes. Yeah, which, really. Uh, I do the same when I go to Italy myself. Um <laughs> So I wanted also to talk about uh, a few things that I've talked about earlier in the conversation. I talked about the fact that you created this amazing business and you were able to generate uh, quite a substantial revenue in, in about a year. So you're at seven figures, which means over $1 million. First off, that's absolutely phenomenal. 
Thank but you. I wanted to know how were you able to do it so quickly? So basically, when you started this business, it took you about a year to, you know, the whole con conception. You put it out there. You launched a website because your business is a website. How did you get the word out so that so many women came to your site and felt so compelled to buy the shoes? Sure. Um, there are three basic ways we, we did that. E-commerce is an, is an interesting thing because the internet is a fantastic place to do marketing. So we obviously do traditional social media marketing. We you know we have a big Facebook presence. You know we have a YouTube channel with some instructional videos. Mm -hmm. So traditional marketing and social media marketing has been helpful. But what we found to be the most useful is we've had a great publicity team and, a, and great response from a lot of the magazines. So the Glossy magazine started writing about us about four months in. It took, a, took them that long to learn about us and to have the magazines come out. Um, but we've been in InStyle Magazine, Lucky Magazine, People Style Watch, Mary Claire. That's been fantastic for us. Um, celebrity partnerships and having celebrities wear our clothes and talk about them, our shoes, has been unparalleled. I mean, really, I had no idea the impact. Mm -hmm. of but it's been fantastic, and you know they, they love our shoes. They love the quality of our shoes. So it's been it's been pretty easy to get celebrities in our shoes, which has been great. And then the final way is really word of mouth and um, repeat customers. People get their shoes, are wowed by them, and immediately order again. Okay, and now I wanted to actually talk about that. One thing that is well known about women is that we talk. When we like something, we'll call our girlfriends, we'll email our girlfriends. So that means that women are getting the shoes, not only they wild enough to talk about it, but you just said they're actually so excited, they're willing and ready to buy another pair of shoes. Oh, absolutely. We've, we've seen, you know, I understand that sometimes, you know, people haven't seen our shoes in person before, or they're hesitant to buy something online, not sure about the fit. So someone will order a pair of shoes, we'll ship it to them. And you can see within a week of them getting the shoes, they'll order three, four more pairs. Once they're confident wow. that we're delivering a quality product, the repeat buying has been fantastic. And also what we see is, you know, when we talk, we talk to our customers a lot, whether via live chat or email or they call us, you know, we always ask how they heard about us. And it's a lot of it is, oh my gosh, my friend wore your shoes at their wedding, or I stopped this woman on the street because she had the most amazing shoes I've ever seen. And we really have been getting a lot of business based on word of mouth and recommendations. Okay, and let's talk about the celebrities. Like, there's one thing getting celebrities in your shoes or your product and whatnot. But the reality is celebrities have unlimited funds when it comes to them being able to buy any shoe they want. And we're talking about, you know, the expensive Italian and French designs. So it's actually amazing that they make these comments about your shoes. And that sort of talks quite highly about the quality of your shoes. There is nothing that is more important to us than the quality of our shoes. We use genuine leather soles. We use soft le lambskin leather on the inside. We add in extra padding so the shoes are comfortable. So I think people are, always, celebrities especially, are impressed by the quality of our shoes. And also, a lot of celebrities are frustrated fashionistas, right? They all, they're surrounded by fashion and shoes all day, and they've started to develop an idea of what they want, right? They have, they see, they have, you know, like you were saying, they have access to, an unlimited number of shoes. But Absolutely. sometimes if you can't find what you're looking for, you, but the world is your oyster, it still doesn't exist, it's something we can make for them. That's amazing. So right now, in terms of uh, your client base, do you find that they're most American and or North American, so U.S. and Canada, or have you branched out already internationally? Um, we m Most of our business still does come from the U.S. and Canada, but we've seen a huge uptick in international orders recently. We ship a lot to Australia and New Zealand. We ship a lot to the U.K. You know, we have one woman in Monaco who orders over and over again. We've Monaco. had orders this week from Sweden and Ireland. So, you know, we ship worldwide. So it's just about getting the word out in all the different territories. And again, Monaco, we're talking about France. We're talking about access to unlimited designers mm -hmm. so close to Italy. So the fact that this woman chose to buy your custom shoes, again, that's that speaks volume. Absolutely. But it, it, my guess is it's similar to the celebrity situation, which is everyone wants to be a fashion designer. And everyone thinks, why can't I find a pink and orange shoe? Mm -hmm. You know, which is you which is behind you, and I love that color combination. It's part of our new spring collection. <laughs> my my cute orange is my favorite color, and pink is my other favorite color, and I've worn them together as clothing, but I've never thought of the shoe, so 
Hmm. You can. Yes, I can. So that's interesting. Cause I did not consider that for that woman in Monaco. The fact that although she's able to buy any shoe she wants from Italian or uh, French designers, but she's not able to get the shoe that she envisions for herself. Exactly. So that's exactly. interesting. Wow. And in terms of your, your, your packaging, do they just get a simple box or do you make it a little fancy? Because, you know, women were very visual and we get wowed by, you know, glitz and, and glamour and whatnot. How have you been able to sort of get that wow effect when the woman opens the cardboard box? Sure. You know, we, um, we played around with a lot of different ideas. One of our first ideas we tried was a clear shoe box because everyone stores their shoes in, in clear shoe boxes. Good we point. did that for a little while, but ultimately we decided that wasn't the, be the best way to go. Um, our shoe boxes are a, a really nice, heavy, thick material, so it's rich feeling. And we have fantastically fun tissue paper on the inside. And, you know, we really try and make it an experience when you open up the package. You know, and these are shoes you've been waiting for. Mm. So it's exciting. And when we email our customers to let them know that we've shipped their package, we send them a picture of their shoe also, so they, so some of the weight is over, at least they can see it. And also you could just, you know, staple it in the front of uh, the, the box. Absolutely. Now, um, I wanted to know, uh, you know, it's, it's quite difficult, in a sense, for you to go online, look at a shoe, select the, the material, the size, because, you know, in a, in, if you go to France, your shoe size might be different from England and also from Italy, which I've dis dis discovered when I've been traveling to Europe. It's not the same shoe size. Same with my shoe size in North America is different in Canada or the U.S. So how is it in terms of the return, or should I say your return policy is 30 days, so you offer women a whole month for them to get the shoe, try the shoe, make sure it's the right shoe. So are you getting a lot of returns? Are a lot of people going and ordering shoes and realizing, oh, oops, wrong size, or oh, oops, these are uncomfortable, or oh, oops, too high of a heel. Right, you know, we've been we've been so pleasantly surprised by how few returns we're actually getting. We're at about four percent returns, um, which is which is fantastic. Very low, very and, very low. You know, we the most mostly the reasons are you know it's a little too small, it's a little too big. So we you know happily remake them for them a half size bigger, a half size smaller. It has not been you know that was a big concern of ours with footwear industry in general mm -hmm. is sizing and returns. And it just hasn't been a problem for us. And are your size similar to sizes? Let's say we were to go to Saks Fifth Avenue or Macy's and buy shoes. Let's say we are a eight and a half. Uh, would we be the mm -hmm. same size on your site as well? Yes, we have very standard sizing. You know, it's it's mind blowing that there is no universal standard for sizes. Yeah. But we do find if we ask women what size do you m wear more often than any other size. Okay. That works pretty well. Okay. And women, you've talked about women in Sweden and women in Monaco. That's a whole different sizing because eight and a half is 39 there. So do you yes. have that sort of differentiation so European women know they can actually have a gauge and they could say, okay, well, the eight and a half is similar to the, okay, excellent. We actually, our shoes are done in European sizes, but we do have a size chart that, that compares and says if you wear an eight in the U.S., you'll wear a 38 in European sizes. Okay, excellent. And also, we're, we're, access, we're so accessible to our clients. Given the time zone, because I'm in the United States and my sister's in Asia, one of us is working at all times. And our office here and our office there, is, it's always covered. So if people have questions and they email us that's, you know, 4 a.m. for me, you know, it's only 7 o'clock at night for our Asia office and they're there to answer questions. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, that's the advantage and disadvantage because as you've pointed out, that means that when you're up, uh, or even when you're about to go to bed, there's always somebody working who might have questions that you might have to answer. Always. Because obviously, if you don't answer the question, then they have to wait eight, ten hours to get an answer. And then by the time they get the answer, because I know my team is also uh, abroad, so if it's two o'clock in the morning for whatever reason and they're emailing me, I know that I have to answer that email because by the time they get the answer, it'll be really, really late. So um, you don't want to waste a day. You don't. You don't because basically you're the bottleneck. Uh, so I, I definitely uh, keep that into consideration. So you're again, I, I'm very blown away by your success because I've heard of companies creating okay. million dollar businesses and I speak to women who created million dollar businesses on a regular basis, but very few have done it in short, such a short period of time. And what I like also is, is the customization uh, that you're sort of creating. Now, um, I interviewed not long ago Ava uh, Beast, who creates, she's in Los Angeles actually, she and her son have created U-Bars, and it's all custom protein bars. And she was, wow. she, yeah, and they've actually gone into custom protein shakes and cereals and uh, trail mix. And she's talking about this whole custom 
uh, nation. And I asked her how she marketed, and one of the ways, of course, they have an online site just like yourself, and one of the reasons why they've been able to experience such a huge success was the fact that the celebrities were very much into what they were producing. And I asked her why, and she explained the same thing. She said, celebrities, they have access to everything and anything. But the fact that they can customize that they want nuts with cranberries and pumpkin seeds or whatnot, that's what's really amazing about it. It's not that they can buy the most expensive thing, but they can buy something that they've created. And, and exactly. that's the same experience that you're offering as well. It's absolutely the same experience because we find that, you know, when you can have anything you want because people will either give it to you or you can afford to pay for it, you know, it, it, lose, it loses its value a little bit. So when it's something that, that doesn't exist but you can create it, all of a sudden there's a lot of value in that. Mm, absolutely. Now, I want to go back to something that you've talked about earlier. We talked about Sex in the City, and I also want to sort of tie that into something that I read on your website. Now, I'm sure that every person watching this knows about Sex in the City and also knows about the shoe obsession in Sex in the City, and hopefully everybody saw that episode where Carrie had to figure out if she was going to buy her apartment or not, and she realized that she had no money, but she had about $40,000 worth of shoes. Now, on your side, I'm going to have to read this one. You talk about being influenced by Sex of the City, of course, Christian Louboutin, uh, Manolo Blanik, Giuseppe Zano Zanotti, uh, Jimmy Shu. But one of the things that you talk about is that you your taste had matured. And there were two things. You didn't want to mortgage your house, which is quite interesting. And sometimes you just couldn't find what you wanted, and that was simply not okay. So let's talk about this mortgaging your house because women are well known to have more than one pair of shoes and we do not buy shoes because we need them because very few of us wear our shoes out. We buy them because we want them. So your shoes are about, what, $295, $300? They're between $250 and $300. Okay. And most of the high-end designer shoes, the French and the Italians, uh, will be, anyways, here in Canada, we're looking at a minimum of $695. Then by the time you add the tax, you're looking at a $700, $800, $900 shoe. If you're looking at a boot, you're looking at $1,600 easily for some of these yeah. boots. So have do you feel that that's sort of... Um, philosophy that you had around women being able to have or get affordable shoes of high quality, do you feel that you've been able to achieve that with your company? Oh, no doubt. I mean, the reason that we found such inspiration in the, the designers that you mentioned is because they all offered a beautiful product mm -hmm. and an incredibly high quality. And those two things we 100% offer all our customers. At an affordable price. At an affordable price. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, yes, you can spend $150 on a pair of shoes. But if it's $150 on a pair of shoes that stay in your closet because they're not exactly right or the heel's too high so they're not comfortable, that's $150 wasted. If you spend $275 on the shoes that is exactly what you want and you amortize that cost, it just makes much more sense to spend a little more for precisely what you want. And let's talk about comfort because some shoes are so painful honestly it's like a headache you, you know sometimes you go oh it's a cheaper shoe yes there's a reason why it's a cheaper shoe it's because oh, yeah. it's there's no quality and you talked about the inside being leather it makes a huge difference between leather and a vinyl because especially oh. when it gets so it hot and your feet start swelling not the same experience huge difference and that's you know because we're a shoe company that started by two women we've spent a good deal of our adult life in high heels so we knew the difference between a high quality shoe and a cheaper shoe. Absolutely. Um, and that was something we weren't willing to compromise on. Um, and it made our prices what they are, but ultimately we were not willing to put out a shoe in the marketplace that didn't have a genuine leather bottom, that wasn't lined in lambskin, that didn't use really soft materials. Because I've had all those shoe blisters. Oh. I've limped home for parties. Oh. I've had to kick off my heels at a wedding to dance. And, I hear you. Know, you. I, I don't want to have to do that anymore. Absolutely. And you know, I mean, when you buy a pair of shoes and you're, you're in pain, it, it shouldn't happen. And, and it's really, uh, it speaks volume of, about the quality of shoes. Because I know that uh, I have not yet become a client, but trust me, with that little combination of pink and orange, it won't take long. But I know that the shoes that I bought in Italy, I'll put them on and I'll, if I have to walk somewhere, I'll walk, come back, and I don't think of the shoes. I don't remember that I have shoes on. When I have shoes that hurt, I can think of nothing else. 
Nothing else. Absolutely. So it's yeah, amazing. It's really, it really is. It, it can ruin a night. It really, like, you are in pain or your back hurts or your knee is swollen and you, you can't dance at a wedding. That's oh, the worst thing. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, Dorian, this has been a really amazing conversation. Thank you so much for allowing the viewers to understand how you've created this phenomenal success story. And I hope that I can have you on the show again because I'm pretty sure that although you are now in the seven figures, uh, you're going to be getting into the multi, multi, multi seven figures in no time. So it'll be great to understand how you've been able to grow that business even further. Well, thank you so much. It really was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you.